Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Logos Project. This is your host, Dom, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about our uh, launching of Ecclesia, which uh, means church in Latin. It's the blog post of The Logos Project. So Ecclesia is going to feature several authors uh, writing on various subjects uh, of a theological nature or of an ecclesial nature, ecclesial concerns, theology of the church. Uh, and also history, liturgy, and uh, and maybe some philosophy um, um, articles, but usually philosophy we use as as a handmaiden to the theological points we make. But yeah, uh, John Salza might be um, soon giving us an article on Ecclesia. Uh, Andrew Bartel just wrote one called Let There Be No Schisms Among Us. I wrote one called Logos and Ecclesia, Mary in Theology and Society, where I kind of um, – you know, make some observations on true ecumenism and how that might actually be the solution here. Uh, and, uh, and how, you know, Mary might also be a solution to internal conflicts within the church. And I kind of, you know, um, open up the theological reasons behind that. I wrote one on the inspiration of scripture, uh, which is just the theology of, of scripture, uh, inspiration. And the first one that I published, I think you guys should definitely check out. It's called a step-by-step -step theological explanation of the Roman Missal. Um, I go through the Missal of Pope St. Paul VI, and I, it's a theological commentary. I go through the rubrics, although not in extreme detail, uh, but in general. And I, I, you know, it's a theological commentary, and it's based off of, uh, most of it is based off of the uh, Gaudium et Spes, uh, not Gaudium et Spes, I'm sorry, Sacrosanctum Concilium, as well as Pope Benedict's uh, Sacramentum Caritatis. So um, uh, I strongly recommend you guys check that out. And uh, if, you know, it might even be posted on Reason and Theology's uh, blog if, uh, if that works out. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so Ecclesia, it's the blog version of the Logos Project. Uh, the idea behind it being that you have the, you know, Christ is the Logos Project, you know, and then uh, Ecclesia is the, the bride, the church. Um, and, you know, so much of what we do at the Logos Project has to do with the nature of the church and the splendor of the church. And and, uh, and and I think there's so much in theology that has yet to be explored when it comes to the nature of the church and how uh, that mystery relates to the others in, in the faith. You know, so much has already been done. That's true. But there's a, I think there's a whole new dimension, as we'll see, um, uh, that is being opened up, uh, especially thanks to Lumen Gentium. Now, uh, go ahead and check out those articles. Uh, I have a link in the show notes for the blog um, website, Ecclesia. Um, but the thing is, um, it costs money to get our own domain name. So uh, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash the Logos Project so we can get our own domain name and it'd be easier to find for people. You know, because right now people are finding it through the links that are being disseminated. But if someone wants to look up Ecclesia blog, you know, that'd be easier if we had a domain name. Now, um, I've been working on a translation of uh, a, uh, it's called a theological note. It's a theological commentary. It's uh, mainly written in response to the Ottaviani intervention. It was written by uh, Don Gérard. And it was um, uh, sent to Cardinal Ottaviani, who read it, who approved of it. And, um, you know, and said, this is good to go, basically. Now, the thing is, uh, you know, this is so important because, first of all, a lot of uh, um, people in, you know, within ecclesial politics like to cite the Ottaviani intervention as a, um, as a good argument as to why there's issues with the new missile. Now, what's fascinating about this uh, article is that it doesn't exist in English at all, anywhere. Um, and so I'm almost done translating uh, translating it. It's it's about, well, let's see, it's a, it's probably about 16 pages on a Word document, font uh, uh, 12. So, um, but what I'm going to do is once it's done, I'm going to post it on, um, on the Ecclesia blog post, and then I'll disseminate that. But it's an excellent response to the, Ottaviani intervention, which was actually penned by uh, Father, he might have been a bishop at the time, but uh, Father uh, Delaurier, and uh, who became a set of a contest. 
Um, and so uh, Cardinal Ottaviani, um, yeah, having read this response by Don Gérard, um, basically um, approved of it, and uh, uh, his, you know, his his quibbles were um, appeased, you might say. So it's going to be an important document to kind of, uh, you know, defend uh, the church and her promulgations, right? Um, and so uh, it's actually very enlightening. I can't wait to share it with you guys. So that being said, let's see. So uh, the link to Ecclesia is in the show notes. Uh, that Don Gérard theological note is coming out hopefully next week. And I really think you guys are going to like that. Uh, we have all these articles already out, three by me, one by Andrew, um, uh, Andrew Bartel, and uh, soon hopefully one by John. And I'm gathering other authors, some theologians and some historians to write for us uh, and some canon lawyers as well. Um, again, we need that domain name. So consider supporting us at patreon.com slash the Logos Project. And things that are upcoming, um, if all if all goes well, because uh, she's very busy, but uh, if all goes well, Dr. Tracy Rowland will be coming mid-March on the show to talk about Joseph Ratzinger Benedict XVI. And that'll be an episode entirely dedicated on him, his thought, and his life. Um, and of course, uh, again, if all goes well, we'll be having Dr. Sean Blanchard back on the show to talk about liturgy, liturgical reform, and the history of liturgical reform. Uh, and that I'm really looking forward to. Um, so yeah, so uh, I've been really busy. Um, you know, I'm behind on like like seven different emails that people have sent me. So I apologize. And uh, you know, the translation work is actually uh, at first it was easy because someone provided uh, a kind of Google Translate on the side, but I'm trying to get it you know as perfect as possible, and it's quite tedious. But uh, and on top of that, I have schoolwork, so that explains why I've been uh, absent for so long. Um, but yeah, so uh, a few things here. I have a list of the things I needed to cover today. Um, let's see. Okay. All right. So the first thing I want to do is give you guys a little sneak peek into the Don Gérard uh, theological note. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs just to give you a sneak peek to what, you know, what to look forward to. So here we have uh, Don Gérard say the following. The new Ordo Mise, promulgated by His Holiness Paul VI, and which entered into practice on November 30th, raised concerns and provoked sometimes categorical opposition among the faithful most attached to the Roman Catholic tradition. The Order of the Knights of Notre Dame, which, profess, which professes to love and defend the Church, its faith, its hierarchy, its institutions, Rule 11 and 12 of their rule, must take a clear position on such an important problem excluding any consideration of human respect and having the sole concern for truth and the common good of the church and of souls. So that's what they set out to do in this uh, uh, really great text. Uh, a few things where I'm like, ah, I would have said, said that differently, but it's very, very good. Uh, it dispels the Ottaviani, the Ottaviani intervention um, mistakes that uh, are present there. Uh, now, as any good author does, this text is good at uh, not uh, setting forth a straw man. And so it it lays forth the issues brought up by some people who were scandalized or who, you know, wrote the Ottaviani intervention. So, for example, here, Don Gérard says, here is the text and the translation, speaking of the um, definition in Chapter 2 of the Institutio Gen uh, Generalis. Uh, and he says, the Lord's Supper, or Mass, is a sacred synaxis, or gathering, of the people of God in one place, under the presiding, the Latin word is richer and does not possess the democratic flavor, which has been attached to the word president in our modern language, over under the presiding of a priest to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. Now, the author here says, what is it exactly? What meaning was really intended by its authors of this definition, right? Catholic? Protestant? In other words, is the Mass reduced to the Protestant Supper, and is the memorial of the Lord only a gesture of remembrance, a symbol of the sacrifice of the cross, and of the spiritual presence of Christ in the midst of his own? Or, on the contrary, should the Cena Dominica be understood as identical to the Catholic Mass in the traditional sense. So at face value, right, the definition can cause consternation, right? Like, uh, like what in the world? Why, why is it not more explicitly Catholic? Is this weaponized ambiguity? 
And so he he lays out the the objection, and you know, and you'll find out once the article is published. He gives a very thorough response, and it's very satisfying. I, I was like, "How is he going to pull this off?" And he does; he pulls it off. So I, I really look forward to sharing that with you guys. And um, okay, so um, that being said, make sure you check out in the show notes Ecclesia, the uh, new blog post for the Logos Project, where many authors are going to be um, writing some articles for you guys. But all that being said, I want to turn to, again, Joseph Ratzinger, who is the man behind all the work here. And we're going to make some observations on uh, more of the kind of uh, far right side and then on the far left side, because there's things going on in the church right now that are, um, you know, the the boats being rocked. Right. And I want to address that with the wisdom of uh, a great man. And so I want to begin by pointing out uh you know, something that was flawed in something that needed reform uh, in 19th century Catholicism. Right. And this has to do uh, has much to do with um, a kind of individualism within Catholic uh, thoughts, but more practice. So uh, I'm not saying that, you know, the faith was not there or something or that it was erroneous. I'm saying there was an emphasis that was unhelpful that needed to be corrected. Kind of like today, we have some emphases that are unhelpful that need correction, right? And so um, here, Ratzinger, um, uh, speaking of the Lubach's book, uh, Catholicism, uh, writes the following. The concept of a Christianity concerned only with my soul, in which I seek only my justification before God, my saving grace, my entrance into heaven, is, for the Lubach, that caricature of Christianity that, in the 19th and 20th centuries, made possible the rise of atheism. The concept of sacraments as the means of a grace that I receive like a supernatural medicine in order, as it were, to ensure only my own private eternal health is the supreme misunderstanding of what a sacrament truly is. The Lubach, for his part, is convinced that Christianity is, by its very nature, a mystery of union. The essence of original sin is the split into individuality, which knows only itself. The essence of redemption is the mending of the shattered image of God, the union of the human race through and in the one, who stands for all and in whom, as Paul says in Galatians 3.28, all are one, Jesus Christ. On this premise, the word Catholic became, for de Lubac, the main theme of all his theological speculation. To be a Christian means to be Catholic, means to be one, means to be on one's way to an all-embracing unity. Union is redemption. For it is the realization of our likeness to God, the three in one. But union with him accordingly, inseparable, but union with him accordingly inseparable from and a consequence of our unity. Um, he continues here, the concentration of what is Catholic, which seems at first glance to be directed exclusively inward, thus is revealed in its original impulse to be an emphatic orientation towards those today who are searching only when the most inward aspect of christianity is proclaimed and lived does it reveal itself as both the answer to and a force equivalent to the dynamism of humanistic atheism to that humanism that seeks the unification of mankind only when we see this clearly can we rightly understand the purpose of vatican council too so I hope you see here how this individualism kind of caused much of the issues that I would say became very apparent after the council. And he says here, right, only when we see this clearly can we rightly understand the council. Um, so <clears throat> a few things here. He says uh, one of the solutions to this is uh, Lumen Gentium, uh, which speaks of the church as the sacrament of salvation. And so he says here, we are ready now to formulate a threefold conclusion based on this new, it's not new, but on this, uh, yeah, it's a new formulation of something that the fathers talked about um, uh, at length. Uh, it was somewhat eclipsed um, later on. He says here, the designation of the church as a sacrament is opposed to an individualistic understanding of the sacraments as a means of grace. 
It teaches us to understand the sacraments as the fulfillment of the life of the church. In doing so, it en enriches the teaching about grace. Grace is always the, be the beginning of union. As a liturgical event, a sacrament is always the work of a community. It is, as it were, the Christian way of celebrating the warranty of a joy that issues from the community and from the fullness of power that is vested in it. Now, remember, this is Ratzinger speaking, uh, you know, and he's very clear. And for example, in the spirit of liturgy, that the, uh, he's not saying that the liturgy is something that the community concocts or creates. Right. It's something that God uh, gives us and we are obedient to. And the meaning of uh, so liturgy isn't an expression of the community's meaning. It's a meaning given by God that impresses itself on the community and then even constitutes the union of the members, right? That's why the Eucharist uh, is the source of the church because it's the body of Christ. And we are, as the church, members of the body. So, uh, you know, it's important to keep that in mind. And finally, when it comes to, um, you know, the, Im the importance of Lumen Gentium here and what we're talking about, he says, the designation of the church as a sacrament thus deepens and clarifies the concept of church and offers a response to contemporary man's search for the unity of mankind. Notice what he's doing here. Remember how he said how atheistic humanism was searching for a kind of communion of mankind devoid from God and, and the church because there was such a problem with individualism in Catholic piety. You see how that's connected here? And so he's saying here, the church is not merely an external society of believers. By her nature, she is a liturgical community. She is most truly church when she celebrates the Eucharist and makes present the redemptive love of Jesus Christ, which, as love, frees men from their loneliness and leads them to one another by leading them to God, right? God is the one that makes that unity possible. It's horizontal and vertical. In fact, it's horizontal because of the vertical. So he holds all of these truths in a good balance and a good tension, uh, unlike people who like to emphasize just the horizontal, think of more progressives, or just the vertical and individualistic kind of think of split off groups, right? And that, that kind of shows the fact that they're split off, that there's that mentality of lack of communion. And so for Ratzinger, he, you know, he says, um, union with God is the content of grace, but such a union has as its consequence, the unity of men with one another. It's beautiful. It's amazing. All right. So now I want to talk about, so that's kind of the critique of uh, a kind of individualistic piety, which uh, um, seeks to do its own thing apart from the body. Right. And you guys know what I'm talking about. We talk about this a lot. Um, on the show, you know, schism, uh, you know, uh, separation or uh, elitism, you know, that's that's not good. It doesn't mean that they don't have good points. It means that they use those points for separation and elitism. That's what's wrong. Not, you know, not necessarily some complaints about things going on in the church. Right. <clears throat> so. I want to point out that there is some troubling things going on there's a, a couple prelates uh, that people have uh spoken about who uh these prelates have been talking about a kind of uh uh you know a, a more encompassing inclusion and and they don't seem to define what they mean by that more sacramental openness to people um uh who actually believe in a different different anthropology um and, you know, as opposed to the call to conversion, the church says, you, of course you're welcome, but, you know, if you believe in an anthropology that's going to hurt you, right, then you're you're going to – it's you excluding yourself in a certain sense, right? What we're offering is an anthropology that will free you and that will make communion possible and the sacraments, you know, are, are, are for you. Um, but uh, there's a sense in which, um, you know, we have to recognize that – the anthropology espoused by uh, by certain people is almost like a self uh, exclusion, and so they you know there's a kind of there's a misunderstanding where it's like well why aren't you letting us uh, you know receive the sacraments you know you guys are bigoted or something it's like it's, that's missing the point we want you to receive the sacraments but you're kind of excluding yourself by believing in something which 
uh, actually hurts you, right? And of course, you know, during and like uh, uh, it's just an excuse for bigotry, um, but but it's not. Uh, you know, if we get down to it, we can talk it through. You know, instead of uh, um, you know throwing insults at each other. Um, but I know it, it sounds for some people it sounds like bigotry, and um, what I would say is that let's talk it through. Uh, you know, in truth, right? So. Uh, truth and charity uh, need to both be present. Um, you know, inclusivity uh, isn't truly inclusive if it doesn't love the person it's trying to include, right? And that's the issue here is that the church's teaching is one of love, but um, it's not perceived that way. And I would actually say it's not perceived that way sometimes because it's our fault that it's not perceived that way. And this is what leads me to what Ratzinger says here. He says, Many a false anxiety about sin created by a narrow-minded moral theology and all too often nourished and encouraged by spiritual advisors avenges itself today by leading people to regard the Christianity of the past as a kind of harassment that kept man constantly in opposition to himself instead of freeing him for open and anxiety-free cooperation with all men of goodwill. This is what the more progressive uh, people are saying. So, I, you know, I, I, I want to lay some of the blame at our feet. That, you know, that's what we should do as Christians is how did we go wrong and how can we make a difference and fix that, right? So uh, here he's saying here is that this is the impression they have. We need to show them that their impression does not correspond to either what we're saying or to the truth, right? We, you know, hopefully what we're saying corresponds to the truth. And so here Ratzinger continues, though, and he becomes critical, and, and, uh, and, and rightfully so. He says that all too guileless progressivism of the first post-conciliar post years, which happily proclaimed its solidarity with everything modern, with everything that promised progress, and strove with the self-conscious zeal of a model schoolboy to prove the compatibility of what is Christian with all that is modern, to demonstrate the loyalty of Christians to the trends of contemporary life. That progressivism has today come under suspicion of being merely the apotheosis of the late capitalistic bourgeoisie, on which, instead of attacking it critically, it sheds a kind of religious glow. Now, this was written in the late 80s, where uh, a lot of the kind of um, craziness, the crazy progressivism was slowly uh, not subsiding. It was becoming people were starting to be skeptical. Wait a minute. Is this really going to work? Um, and um, now I think a lot of it's come back. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and it's come back because we're talking about it right now, because some prelates have been saying things that seem to not understand what the church um says and means right and teaches um and that's why the boat is being rocked and we need to respond and uh bishop baron wrote a great article uh uh you know about this about what inclusion means and it was an excellent article i strongly recommend uh, i'll put it in the show notes after this live stream um and so it's a it's really frustrating to me because in the name of acceptance and love, uh, we're selling a lie that will, in the end, only hurt people, right? Um, and 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 it's also frustrating because a lot of this is kind of our own doing, but it's also the doing of you know um, paganism and lack of faith and a kind of a, not just post-Christian world but an anti-Christian world, right? So there's blame to go around, but there's a deep misunderstanding. And it frustrates me because sometimes I just want to shake people like that's not what we're saying, right? It's like what we're saying is actually freeing, right? And so that's what's frustrating. And uh, it's 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 even more frustrating when prelates, you know, uh, don't understand this. Um, and it's not just my opinion versus the opinion of uh, so-and-so. No, it's like the church has been very clear and taught very beautifully these things. And, uh, and, and so uh, other prelates are standing up to say to these prelates who misunderstand, you're misunderstanding. Like Bishop Barron, for example, said, you know, what do you mean by um, uh, inclusion? And uh, yeah, so anyway, so um, Ratzinger adds, a Christianity that believes it has no other function than to completely than to be completely in tune with the spirit of the times has nothing to say and no meaning to offer. What are we offering if we just cave in, right? Nothing, nothing. 
uh, it has to be something more profound. You know, it's not like we're offering opposition or hatred. Um, and, and, you know, and that's, that's what they think. That's why they think we should cave in, you might say. But if either if we offer opposition, we're just we're wrong and we're doing harm. And if we cave in, then we have nothing to offer. There's a third option, which is we have something to offer that's offer that's more profound and more freeing. And it's it's a truth that we've forgotten as a society. And that's what I would say. And Ratzinger says it is not the ideology of adaptation that will rescue Christianity, although adaptation is still operative wherever with sycophantic zeal or tardy courage, those institutions are criticized, which in any event have become the powerless butts of world publicity. And in so doing, incidentally, have entered once again into the apostolic tradition. Nothing can rescue it but the prophetic courage to make its voice heard decisively and unmistakably at this very hour. We need more people like Bishop Barron uh, to say that what we are offering will give you a freedom that you can't even imagine. Um, a lot of times the freedom that is sought is just a form of, of slavery. And, and so that's why it's love in truth, because it's not really love if we're just going to lie to people or let them lie to themselves. doesn't mean we, you know, uh, bang the door down and force people to do things. That's also not love and charity because uh sorry uh, love and truth because the truth uh for it to be fully the truth must always be something freely given and freely accepted or else it's not the truth it becomes ideology and imposition and uh, coercion the truth and freedom cannot be separated which has a lot to do with uh Sumane, the document on religious freedom of the second vatican council so I wanted to offer those observations on some of the, you know, we've kind of sowed the seeds of partly of our own destruction. I don't want to overemphasize that because, uh, you know, it's not like we're always to blame. There's real forces at play here that uh, are from the enemy, right? I also want to point out the misunderstanding and how it's frustrating when prelates misunderstand what the church uh, says. And thank God for those prelates who... Um, who step up and say, no, 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 this is not what the church is saying. Uh, you know, let's, you know, what you're offering is going to hurt people. We want to help people. But it also shows you that our society really has become pretty um, sick, like sick in the sense of uh, it's ill, right? And uh, and so the remedy is a proper understanding of communion, which is why to understand this is to understand the Second Vatican Council and what it really taught, right? This is the hermeneutic of reform, Right. Uh, which is a hermeneutic of, of continuity, because I showed you how the faith didn't change, but a reform took place. Um, and uh, so we're seeing some of the problems before the council, you know, the kind of individualism and understanding of the sacraments that wasn't full enough. And then the problems after, which is this rampant progressivism that wants to just cater to the world and comply to it. So if you guys have any questions, put them in the chat, put it at the Logos Project. But I just want to encourage everybody to go check out the blog in the show notes, Ecclesia. Um, I'm really happy it's finally launched. Uh, we're going to get that domain name, hopefully, uh, if you support us at patreon.com slash the Logos Project. And I'm truly grateful for all of the support from, uh, from uh, uh, people who watch the show. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you want to join our Telegram group, uh, Get With Haley. Uh, she's in the uh, chat box and she can, uh, you know, she can ask me for the link. I, I had to make the link private because, uh, you know, some people were showing up that I didn't want to be there. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, we also have actually, uh, Bible studies on Tuesdays and Fridays. I'm actually missing today's Bible study because of this live stream, but those are a lot of fun. Uh, we we're going through the book of Romans. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some, we got some smart autodidacts in our group so uh if you want to uh, you know increase your knowledge of the faith it's a good place to be um <clears throat> so yeah uh looking at my notes here i think i covered everything i need to cover um uh go ahead and uh uh read that first post that i posted uh the theological walkthrough of the missile look forward to the one by don jira and uh and andrew's post i thought was really good which is the um uh, the one on schism. So that being said, like, subscribe, 
hit the notification bell, comment down below. I'll, as as usual, uh, be civil. And you can find us on all podcasting platforms at The Logos Project. And uh, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash The Logos Project. And so without further ado, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.